Welcome back to the Mason Cox Show. Now, today we've got one of my favorite people in media. Um, she is a lovely, lovely lady. She's actually one of my mom's favorite people. And <laughs> I think she messages my mom back and forth on Twitter. But um, we'll give you a bit of a background. She's nine, nine years at Fox Sports, AFL, cricket, basketball, worked across all different sports. Started in Perth Radio at 6PR in 2006. Um, tonight... Sorry, today, tonight for Seven Network, uh, before the game, have you been paying attention? Also was on the footy show with myself uh, back in 2019, and she's also worked for things like the Australian Open. Uh, she's an absolute legend. Uh, people really breaking the stigma, I feel like, a female in sport and commentating. She's one of the OGs, one of the best that's ever done it. We've got Nairly Meadows. Thank you very much. That was a very kind intro. I'll take that. Yeah, yeah that's good. Well, <laughs> you've got an impressive resume, I must say, and I was ignorant coming to this country, but I love the fact that you are, I feel like, the, in my mind, probably the number one person I feel like I've got along with, probably on air, whenever I do things in the media. I feel like you're very, obviously, you've got the podcast, Ordinarily Speaking, which we'll talk about, um, and it's all about kind of mental health and showing a different side of athletes. And for some reason, I don't know, maybe you can maybe give me a bit more intro on it, um, is you're very good at being able to get people to open up to you. I feel like you're a very calming personality. Um, you know your stuff, and that's what's gotten you really well in that in your career. But I feel like you're just a, a person that everyone loves to be around, and is just an enjoyable person to, to have on the on the podcast. I'm excited. Can I just get that audio clip, yeah, yeah, please? We'll I'm just, I might make that my ringtone. On <laughs> the <stuff>. ringtone, <laughs> I love it. Um, Brendan um, can clip it up and give it to you. <laughs> <laughs> that is very kind of you. Thank you. Um, and yes, your mum does. Does she still, still message you? <laughs> yeah, she <Love> she <laughs> She's your biggest I fan. I do love your mum because I think I interviewed your parents um, who managed to make it for your debut game and it was Anzac Day, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And um, your mum was just such an absolute sweetheart. And then, and then from there, she's just she loves it. followed just what loves I've it. done and sort of sends messages of support does when she, things are down. Does she DM you? Does my mum DM she you? She has DM'd me, but mostly it's public. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, do you have my better mom's her number? Than you, to be honest. So. Yeah, yeah, it's probably, it's probably better. My mom's a lovely lady, but the um, fact that she's DMing friends of mine, and <laughs> colleagues of mine, is, is very questionable. No, I love it. She she's amazing, and um, she's such a supportive woman. I think just in mm. general, and I yeah, like you say, I think she recognised early days that I was more of a human story yes. type journalist, and she jumped on board with that. And and I love your mom. She's absolutely fantastic. But um, she's gonna love this part. <laughs> <laughs> She's going to love the shout out of the pod. She'll she make it her me, ringtone. <laughs> oh, no doubt, no doubt. She was asking about, um, I told her I was getting you on. She's very excited for this. So she's <laughs> going to be very excited for this podcast and what we go through. Big shout out to Jay Cox. We love her on the pod. <laughs> Hi, um, Jay. <laughs> you're going to get a DM within the week, I guarantee it. <laughs> Next time I'm in the States, I'm just going to like message her. Oh, she will her tell you to come to the house. No, 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 she will full kit out the whole house ready for you to go. Dad will cook a barbecue. It'll be a whole thing. I'm telling you, it's going to be Nerly's week in Dallas, Texas. Um, the biggest week of the year, probably better than me coming back in all honesty um <laughs> we'll jump in now we'll talk about your early life now you're born and raised in collie wa yep. outside margaret river now margaret river is on my top list of places i haven't been yet to um you need to go um, i go at least every every year do you? my best mate lives there and works at vast felix winery which is one of the top notch oh, wineries oh, yeah so it is and i was there just a couple of weeks ago actually oh, yeah what's the top place to do, a top thing to do in margaret river besides go to the wineries well it is go to the wineries yeah, yeah. i mean the beaches are fantastic but the the long lunches that you can have with you know with your mates is just like it's the stuff that you make memories mm. out of you know it's just an epic place to be um beautiful coastline beautiful cafes yeah i love very relaxing river. holiday very you relaxing like that, yeah. it's that it's that beautiful sort of bush meets ocean bush aussie meets vibe ocean. love that yeah yeah so um, would you say collie's the bush side so Collie is inland. Um, yeah. So we're about 45 minutes inland from Bunbury. And as we got teased um, back in the day, you go up a hill to go down a hole. Wow. Um, Shout yep. out to Collie. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but it's a beautiful town, Collie. Um, some amazing yeah. little water spots and everything like that. Mm. And a great outdoor town. So big sporting town, country town, sort of every, you know, everywhere had like a netball club and a footy club yeah, and that yeah. sort of thing. So um, had a unbelievable upbringing because we had a little hobby farm, um, oh. five acre hobby farm because that's how my dad grew up on a, on a farm. So yeah. Um, yeah, we had everything, like a third of a basketball court and um, all like Jeez, sort okay? of dad made it. Like it's not fancy oh, it's, stuff. Okay, yep, yeah, yeah. Um, so, but <laughs> amazing. <Jerry> yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> like Marin Ponds, you wouldn't know what a Marin is, would you? No idea. Give me a, give so, me a, I'm an Australian citizen. I need to learn these things. So you please, <laughs> please inform me. Well, a lot of Australians <laughs> don't know either um, because it's from that 
that region. So it's oh, okay, basically yeah. freshwater crayfish. It's delicious, Ooh. delicious, but really, oh, really hard to to get. Really expensive, but we grew up marining and and on that little bit of river, and we had marin ponds and stuff like that. Marin so ponds. yeah, um, but yeah, and and like a little cricket set up and basketball and netball. We had a bit of everything. So it was an epic place to to grow up. Yeah, I was very lucky. Did you did you play sports growing up? Like what was your top sport? Like I, I feel like I've dabbled in different sports growing up and a lot of people do. They play different sports and then kind of find their niche and go towards it. Like what was your niche sport that you loved? But basketball was always my favorite. Like yeah. if, if I could have chosen a career, I would have been a professional basketball. I must shout out. You've got the Valley t-shirt I on do right have now the Valley too. So <laughs> it's, um, she's uh, fair to say she's a fan of the NBA and fan of of the Suns, I would say. Yeah, and DA signed on, so I'm happy we kept the boys together. So another two at the <laughs> tweeted about this too, and I was like, she's really invested. That's, that's when the siblings group really glad gets on a high is when they're signing news at the Suns. There's a whole and, family, whole family supporters of them. Yeah. So how did that come to be? Um, well, basically, my my oldest brother's five and a half years older than me, and in is the this, early is this 90s, Ian? that's Ross. Is this Ross, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So Ross, um, he played hockey for Australia and is now a yeah. teacher, and he was so he always set the standard with sport um in our family and he yeah loved Charles Barkley as so many people did yeah. back in the day and just hardcore went in on the sons and so we followed him basically as you know the younger yeah, brother youngest. and sister do and so yeah 30 plus years on um and we went and watched them live when I was 12 um and, you know, they were crap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was just like, for and a while so, they weren't so great. That was kind of really fused while you were actually, Which like, invested in so them. Which is why we so excited. And, and then Chris Paul came around. I feel like things turned around. Yeah, exactly. So um, it's so exciting now to actually be in and amongst it. Obviously, it was devastating this year to get knocked out and yeah. not get that run at the actual final series. But we won't talk about that. But, um, yeah, I got the opportunity when I was covering the Super Bowl and All Star NBA All-Star Weekend earlier this year, I did, like, a sort of 22-hour stopover in Phoenix to watch them and I dropped a K Jeez. at the Sun store. A thousand dollars. Aussie dollars or American dollars? Aussie dollars. Okay, so like 20 bucks American. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's not too bad, right? Um, because obviously I've got my two big brothers yeah, I've got, got five got... nieces and nephews so and of, myself. Not and a lot so, of Suns gear in Collie. Uh, exactly. It's hard to come by, although it's it's easier now because they're actually good but for years you couldn't yeah. get anything. Um, so I was the full-blown Nuffy with two bags of merch mm. watching the game by myself. But anyway, my brother's appreciated it. And my eldest brother, Ross, who I got the DeAndre Ayton shirt for, so he's yeah. very relieved that DA is signed on. Huge. Um, but yeah, so I played basketball. But yeah. as I say, I was always um, too short, too slow, um, and just not good enough to <laughs> play for a living. So I decided to watch for a living instead. Have you ever done a celebrity um, tournament or something? I feel like you'd probably like no, just be oh that secret, just undercover person who rolls in and just dominates. <laughs> no no I, one expects I it. It's like, ah, oh, it's just a bit shorter side. Like, and then she just absolutely murders everyone. I am the person that does all the one percenters because I'm no good at anything else. So yeah, I'm, I'm setting the screens. I'm doing like hard D. I'm like Deliver Dover without being able to shoot, basically. Yeah, well, that was my college career <laughs> in basketball. So you've really summed it up in one. Um, now you're talking about Ross, you've got another brother, Ian, who yeah. this is an interesting kind of like fun fact I didn't know about. Ian I was on Home and Away and we're recently talking about this. He also had a Netflix series come out, which is, I love to hear because like, I know you love your family. I love my family. We've talked about it already, but um, your brother Ian's doing some very unique things that a lot of people probably didn't know that you, I guess, were related or maybe like you had a connection to him and what he's doing now in like the Netflix series and everything else. Like, tell us a bit about that. Yeah. So it's funny. Um, because home and away, obviously, you know, it's it's an institution yes. in Australia, but also in like the UK and places like that. And his storyline is still to this day one of the most popular storylines that ever existed on the channel. Give because it to us. What is it? He, he stabbed Sally. Oh, huge. And <laughs> Sally. Ooh, ooh. Anyone know who knows home, home and away, away knows no, like, Sally is Kate Ritchie and she basically huge. just grew okay. up on the show. And so, he killed her. And, well, no, he didn't kill her. Oh, he stabbed her. And, that's but the is, cliffhanger yeah. for the summer was, will Sally oh, survive? Gosh, it's such and a it just was drama. Thing. Thing, and I remember when he first got that storyline, he sort of he was like, "You're never going to believe this. I stabbed Sally." And did you get the Did you get like the inside info? And you're like, "I'm literally sworn to secrecy. I can't yeah, say anything." But I'm, oh. I'm quite good at that. So, yeah, okay. so I stabbed um, Sally. What a yeah. thing to be known for. But it's it's actually and more people know him for a show called The Moody's and a Moody Christmas, which has sort yeah. of become a cult classic on the ABC, and and a lot of families watch it as their family tradition now. Um, oh, okay. So it's this amazing comedy show on the ABC, and it's funny because. 
because he um, gets recognised most for that. And we were at the footy just the other week and somebody came up to him and he's really? like, hey, Dan Moody. <laughs> and one of the almost most embarrassing moments of my life was when uh, Frio made it to the 2013 grand final and I took my brother, even though he's a West Coast supporter, as my yeah. plus one. And somebody came up to us outside the MCG and said, oh, my God, can I get a photo? And I was this, like, so close because it was in context right at the MCG. I was going to say, talking, yeah, no were worries. Were they talking to you or him, though? I was, I was this close saying, yeah, no worries. And then he turns to my brother and says, I'm a massive fan of the Moody's. And oh, passes me his camera. That's and I was so like, it's good. So also degrading for you is like, oh, <laughs> no, nah, I don't really want to. I was like, so relieved that I didn't say, yeah, no worries. <laughs> oh, how embarrassing. It's but, like I've had people be like, oh, can I get a photo? And then it's like to the person next to me and then they just hand me the phone. And I'm like, the best? Yeah, yeah, we'll do. All right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, and so he's he's created a show called RFDS, um, yep. which was a big success on Channel Seven as well. He sort of wrote and created that, and it's been renewed for a second season and clickbait. So, yeah, he's it's doing stuff, which is yeah. awesome. I'm really proud of him because it's it's obviously a really tough industry. Yeah, oh, it's crazy. It's come all the way from Collie too to the big smoke of yeah, Hollywood. Yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty cool. And that's the thing, like RFDS is all about telling those sort of outback stories of yeah. Australia and telling them in a really compelling way because I think a lot of the time, you know, it's the same as the States in a way. Like people refer to rural um, places in a kind of dismissive or Hicksville kind yeah, of way. Redneck. And it's, yeah. yeah, and it's just not true. Like there are so many amazing people who live in the country that just didn't want to live in the city and yeah. that doesn't make them dumb or whatever. <laughs> like, no. so I think, you know, the beauty of the storytelling that he's doing is, is pretty cool because yeah. it is those, um, inclusive sort of stories. And it's a small town, like family type place, you know, everyone knows everyone. I love that. Like, Maybe college like this, you talk about Margaret River, you like walk into a place. I mean, you had your local cafe here and I walked in, you like instantly knew who the person was that was behind. <laughs> I was like, I don't need to introduce anyone. Like, it's just like, I'm the oddball out here. Yeah. Tall. <laughs> She's like, all your friends are so tall. I'm like, not this tall. <laughs> I, I would think I'm on the higher end of the spectrum, but <laughs> no, so. um, yeah, no, it's, I love that kind of family feel. That's something in Australia I've noticed is people here are very generous and just very caring and like everyone's a family here. It's kind of a weird, weird thing to, I guess, somewhat try to describe to people, but that's kind of been my experience, I feel like, the Australian culture. Yeah, like the mateship. And so dad was the country doctor and he had quite a like, oh. unique Land Cruiser car. It was a unique colour. No one else in town had it. So every time it was like sort of this brownie sort of tinge, uh, okay, yeah. but it, nothing fancy. I was hoping but... like bright orange. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> but no one else had it. And because we we're in a town of just under 10,000 and when we were learning to drive, if you were behind his car, you had to do the two finger wave oh, to every yes, single car that, that goes yes, fast. That's real country like Because they Australia. all know it's like dad's car. So yes, the two finger acknowledgement off the steering wheel. <laughs> if you're all lazy, just the one. Yeah. Just, <laughs> It's like, come on, man. Just, um, but yeah, that full blown country thing that you got to say hello to everyone. And yeah. Um, yeah. Well, being the being the small town doctor, I feel like you'd, you'd be the most important person in, in the town. Like, yeah. So the year before me, uh, my year and the year after me, he was the only doctor doing obstetrics. So if you're my age, you were delivered by my dad. Um, Huge. I was delivered by my dad in our house. How many deliveries do you reckon he's done? Uh, I think like a couple of thousand over the years. So he's delivered like a tenth of the town, probably. We, oh, well, he's moved on. <laughs> he's moved on from now. From Collie now, they they now live in Perth. But yeah, I mean, oh, okay, a big yeah. chunk of it. Like he's either he's and there's a few people that he delivered both generations, um, uh, which is pretty cool, actually. which is pretty cool. Yeah. So um, it's yeah, and I I don't think like country GPs get enough credit as well because mm. everything that they do, um, it's it impacts them. You know, they know the people yeah. they're dealing with. And mum was the psychologist in town, and dad was the country doctor. So um, smart family. Yeah, I mean, I'm a real letdown, aren't no, I? I just watch sport you're for not. a living. I knew that was what you were going to say next. You're like, oh, I'm not a doctor or a lawyer into psychology, but I think you're the post most well known person of the Meadows family. I would oh, say. I, I mean, look. Just say yes. I know. I know. I, I'll, I take know I'll take it. I'll take it. Thank you for the compliment. Uh, I appreciate it. I have the advantage of India that my brother. Did. Yeah, you've got the most followers of everyone. I would say that. <laughs> Let's just go with that. Um, I do want to ask you something because. You had an experience that I've had. You went to university in America yep. at the University College. of Tennessee. Go yep. Vols. Yep. Big fan of the Vols. Bright Orange. I now, said it's we were great bright orange. to be a Tennessee Vol. <sighs> That's awesome. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't know that bit of it, but I will say. <laughs> I want to ask you, obviously, going to university, you've probably been to a football game. Tennessee Vols. <laughs> 
massive, yeah. massive stadium. I'm not sure how many they would fit there. It'd be close to it's 100, like 104,000, I think, from memory. Nayland, insane. Yeah, and, and it sold out pretty much every game. And, and they were pretty crap when I was there. But yeah. um, it was Phil Fulmer, and they couldn't pick a quarterback, and it was hilarious because I was doing an internship at the local TV station, and um, they obviously loved the fact that it was a chick from Australia who loves sport. Yeah. And I remember turning to them going, "Why they need a pick and stick. Like, they keep mm. swapping between quarterbacks. And they're like, even the Aussie Just chick <laughs> gets it. Why do they not get it? Kind of thing. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, it was an unbelievable experience. What was your favourite? Like, I know obviously you've got Alabama as probably like one of the biggest games you'll probably play. But was there any experiences that kind of stick out in your mind of like college? Because... I feel like a lot of people in Australia don't quite understand it. And it's tough to describe it until you've actually experienced it firsthand of the tailgating, the game, uh, being amateur level, but having as, uh, just as much, if not more, actual supporters. Like, yeah. It's kind of tough to get your head wrapped around it. Like, Give me, uh, I guess, some way to maybe describe it in your words of the college experience back in the US. Yeah. So it's it's like every movie you've ever seen and then some. It's, it's like the movie's... A- a- actually, actually not. happen. Yeah, yeah, but it's but it's on like on roids kind yeah. of thing. So, um, like a couple of experiences that I had. Uh, Kenny Rogers came and played at halftime Huge. and played the gambler, and the the band spelt out Kenny with their bodies. Oh my gosh! I love um, it. There were fireworks, you know, <laughs> after every touchdown. Um, Peyton Manning, he because he was a yep. vol, um, he had his jersey retired um, at homecoming oh, while wow. I was there, and. Yep. Gave it the old, I don't want to be remembered as a great footballer. I just want to be remembered as a great man who just happened to play football. And everyone's just like. Ah! Everyone loses their mind. There's yeah. like icons of every exactly. school. Peyton Manning exactly. is 100% the icon yeah. of the Vols. <laughs> exactly. Um, and Candace Parker as well from ah, a basketball perspective. She was huge. around. She was playing when I was there. I didn't know yeah. her. But well, women's basketball would have been massive there. Yeah. Well, yeah. The, the basketball stadium is about 25,000 capacity as well. So, yeah, um, yeah just an epic um, life experience and yeah, loved every, every second of it. So, but yeah, the tailgating, all of that, it's, it's very much real. <laughs> it's very much real. I feel like it's a, it's a bucket list item for people. They need to experience it before. hundred percent. hundred percent. And you have to do it firsthand. Like you can't, like people can talk about tailgating, but it's literally, you could walk up in the middle of a football game, not know anyone in the, like the parking lot and just walk through and people are like, oh, have a, have a sausage, have a hamburger, come in. There's like six TVs underneath like a gazebo and everyone's got satellite TV watching yeah. together. It's just a weird experience in general. And and the hatred, you know, it's a bit like Collingwood Carlton, like mm. Alabama and Tennessee, for example. Like my mum's best mate is from Alabama and she's constantly buying my family merch, and you know, Roll Tide Roll. And I'm like, roll stop tide. wearing it. <laughs> Your blood went to Tennessee. We go for the Vols. Like this is offensive, but they just, they don't care. They're not. They I have no idea no. now. I mean, like and Alabama's like, yeah. next level. Like they're just the top yeah. tier of the top tier. But yeah. um, awesome experience. I, I, I love whenever people talk about their college. I, and you can't dive too much into it because I'm sure you had some fun in college. Oh, I drank does. more in that six months than I did. Probably the rest of your life. And it's hilarious because I was 19 when I went over there. So I wasn't oh, legal, but I'd been be legal. Saying this. Well, I, I, <laughs> I like, had been legal in Australia for like almost year, two yeah. years. And um, turned 20 over there. So I had to use a fake ID and I used the ID. You might a, have to cut this out. Of a, <laughs> <Keep going. laughs> of a woman called Anneli Ab, a, a friend of mine. Um, yeah. She was from Estonia. And without, this, is like, this is a classic passport. Without, like. No, it was like a driver's license. Um, and I'm sorry to say, but most Americans didn't know what the hell Estonia no, was. So I just told it. them it was a state of Australia and they were fine with that. <laughs> The only time it didn't oh work God. for me was when one guy said, I, I um, am in the same class there? as Annalie, so oh, this, I know it's not you. Really and I was like, and you're like, next bar. <laughs> next bar. Um, yeah, but I put on the freshman 15, but in my senior year, like, yeah. I came home and, I mean, over there I was hot with an accent kind of thing. <laughs> and yeah. I came home and I was just really white in the middle of the Australian summer, overweight, and I just came in with my two giant suitcases and said, I had a whale. Time. <laughs> Grand old months there. <laughs> oh my gosh. I love that you just told us you just literally did something illegal on the podcast. <laughs> like, yeah, you fake, fake, fake ID. ID, right? Um, my mom listens to this podcast, <laughs> so I have not, mother. Uh, I love you very much. Um, 
<laughs> Maybe once or twice. We'll tell that story. Thanks, Nolan. Um, now, we'll move into, obviously, you've got your own path, our podcast, yep. ordinarily speaking. Yep. And um, you've got some amazing people on there. Some some people, obviously, you're massive in cricket with the, the stuff you do there. And um, you've got some amazing people have come on. Uh, I've listened to your AFL side of things, too. Um, what is your favorite thing about having your own podcast? I mean, obviously, it's great having your own speaking about different subjects and topics you want. But what's your personally your favorite thing about doing it? Um, getting the feedback from people that it's actually helped them. Because as you said yeah. earlier, my podcast is sort of a really heavy focus on mental health yeah. and overcoming adversity and resilience and, and celebrating that resilience and the human stories of athletes because I don't think we do that enough. I think it's a really critical industry a lot of the time and particularly in AFL. Um, and I like to celebrate people and I think it's really inspiring when people see athletes as human beings and realize that what you've achieved is achievable for them too. Why not? Um, so when you get feedback, like for example, I did one with Greg Hire and he received a message and and he put it on um, Instagram that said, um, and trigger warning here for anyone who's listening, but it basically said, I was driving home to end my life and mm. I listened to your podcast and it, and it saved my life. I'm Jeez, still here. And I get goosebumps when I sort of relay that story because that's through the strength of Greg having um, – you know, the ability to share his story publicly and then his motivation is to help people. And anyone who comes on the podcast, that at the end of the day is their motivation. And, you know, you recognise that as an elite athlete, you do have an opportunity to help people um, in whatever way it is. So I think for me, that's, that's the most rewarding thing. Um, but there's also laughs and there's lighter moments as well, because that's, that's humanity, right? Even in the darkest moments, we have that humor. And especially in Australia, I think you probably would have found that, that we'll make light of everything and anything. (laughs) Um, but yeah, that's, that's my favorite thing is because I set out to humanize athletes and help people listening. And so when you achieve what you set out, um, it's, it's a really rewarding feeling, especially when it's your passion project. Like there's no money out of it or yeah. anything. It's just my passion project of, um, you know, I love doing in-depth interviews, grew up with a mum that's a, a psychologist. So I learned really early on about, you know, the importance of silence and listening and empathy and to be able to meld all my sort of worlds together of having that passion for psychology, um, having the passion for sport, but ultimately seeing myself as a storyteller. It's it's awesome to be able to use all those facets and and hopefully try and help people. Did your mom review you? She loves it, yeah. And she actually, <laughs> it's quite funny. She will often, oh, that was a great question. That was a really good love follow-up that. question there. Or I loved how you left that silence there, mm. you know. And a lot of the time I will call mum, and I think this is really important too, to debrief. Yeah. Because sometimes it's really heavy. And oh my gosh, you, yeah. you need to be able to talk to somebody to be able to go, bloody hell, mum. Like he, he just said X, Y, and Z. Like I don't even know if this is ever going to go to air because mm. it's so intimate what he shared. And, you know, sometimes people like regret stuff and say, oh, I don't actually want that out there. I mean, that was the Ryan Brockoff um, yeah. episode and and he did. He was fine with it being out there. He just wanted to check with his family. So everything actually has gone to air. Um, but that's another thing that I sort of, when you're doing something independently, you can guarantee people if you change your mind or whatever, yeah. I, I have all the control here. There's no boss telling me, no, 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 we have to use this or we're going to promo this or whatever. And so it just gives an extra layer of security, I think, for people that they can trust um, what their words will end up sounding like. Yeah. Um, and like I say, when you give people that level of assurance, it's amazing what they then feel comfortable sharing with you. And I've never had somebody say, I don't want to answer that. And I've never had somebody say, I want you to take that piece out. Um, and I think it's because they trust the intention behind the podcast in the first place. Yeah. You, you create that safe space for someone to be able to properly open up and, and talk about things that a lot of times, like, I feel like you just keep it and bottle it up for a long time and then eventually you get to the point where you're like, I mean, maybe this actually can help someone else in the same same situation, whoever it may be. And, you know, some people put, I guess, athletes and people on a pedestal and at the end of the day, we're just normal humans. Everyone is human and everyone's the same, comes from the same makeup. And it's um, it's weird to think that sometimes people get idolized to the point where they think that they don't have the human experiences that yeah. other people do. A hundred percent. And the point that you just made there is 
something that really matters to me is that a lot of people find it a cathartic experience. I have people, you know, I guess who end up thanking me for what I've given them or, or family members, which is even more um, incredible when you hear from a family member. Um, and yeah, I think that is really important to me. And I lose a lot of sleep over how will this be viewed? Will that person regret saying that? Will, you know, I think about the impact on their lives and I think that's why no one has ever regretted it because I yeah. sort of think through all of that and the potential to, to cause harm rather than do good. So um, yeah, that cathartic nature, I, I would hate it if somebody regretted doing an interview with me, whether it's a podcast or on air or whatever, I, I, that to me would just be the worst thing. Yeah. Now I want to ask you this in the podcast, if you had one episode that you would want someone to listen to, I know this is going to be tough for you to answer because all these people are probably your friends now. One podcast episode you could promote to say, this is what it's all about. Which one would it be? I mean, it is, it is so hard because they're all so unique and, and interesting and, like I love them for different reasons, um, but still one of my favourites I think will always be Peter Siddle, um, which was one of the earliest ones I did because he was, you know, and still is a friend of mine. I'm going to be catching up with him in the in the UK next week. And so for your knowledge, he's a former <laughs> test cricketer. <laughs> oh, the fact you're like, cricket, by the way, cricket. Does not know much about it. All right. So, Peter Siddle, give you an idea. I mean, all you, I know you is Don Bradman, 99.94, or it was. That's, that's, that's the extent of my cricket. To... That's all well, as a Victorian and Australian now, Peter Siddle uh, oh. is, a, you know, an important. I'm here to learn. I'm here to learn. No. Um, but he was also a, a good friend of mine. And I sort of said to him, Would you be willing to come on this podcast that I'm starting out? And it didn't exist at the time. And so you're yeah. kind of just hoping, you know, Adam Trelaw was another one, former teammate yeah. of yours, early days who came on. And I, I said to him, you know, would you be willing to talk about when you gave up drinking? Because he's a total teetotaler now and has been for now it's about 10 years. Yeah. Um, I said, the frame of mind that you were in when you gave up drinking and why you did so. And I didn't really know the answer to it. And he hadn't told anyone publicly. Um, and he he said, yeah, I'm, I'm willing to do that because I think it will help people. And he is such a happy-go-lucky guy, kind of similar personality to you, actually, like just the outgoing sort of, you know, doesn't drink but can still stay out until 2 o'clock in the morning because he's just a people person kind of guy. Yeah. And he came on the podcast and just poured his heart out and was so yeah. open about so many things. And it, it hit me in a way because I think because I was friends with him and I didn't really know what was about to transpire and – um, and I think that podcast has, has helped a lot of people. Like, that's another one that I have got a lot of feedback on. And, you know, pe one guy said, this is the podcast I needed to hear right now. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to give up drinking. My family doesn't understand. Um, but I've been able to send them this podcast and say, this is why. Like he's speaking he's on behalf of me with, yeah. almost. And so it becomes this tool sort of as a communication tool for other people. And there's times where my friends are going through stuff and I can say, hey, listen to the Kate Campbell episode because she mm. articulates it so beautifully and I think it's going to really help you. So if something can become like an actual tool like that, it, it's pretty awesome, I think. But, yeah, the, the SIDS one is still one of my personal favorites but it's hard it's like choosing your favorite kid yeah i was gonna say like favorite movie but yes favorite kid yeah that's that's totally the same um geez, we all know mom and dad have a favorite child though let's be honest it's my brother at the moment it's not me i left I, my I parents know. back in america they're like i haven't produced any that. grandkids so i'm way down the toilet yeah that's it well, my mom does tell me that my stories are way more interesting <laughs> So. See, my mom says the same thing. I think that's the way of saying, like, we love you, but you're just not there. You're it's just like, not, you're not at the top of the totem pole. It's <laughs> as mum would always say when we brought art projects home as kids, it's got character. It means it's, it's a big shit. <laughs> It's like, I'm not mad. I'm just disappointed. Um, <laughs> now we'll talk about a bit of your, your career. And we briefly mentioned this because cricket, obviously, I think a lot of people know not being Australian. I'm a bit ignorant is what some people might say. Um, I've tried to learn. I have tried to learn. Don't get me wrong. But um, this is what you're doing now. And you're, you're traveling the world doing it. Like you're going to Pakistan, you're going to India, you're going all over the world and covering cricket. And one of the craziest places, and I, I just want to kind of get, I guess, a bit of a an understanding of how big cricket is in, in India. Like India is a, over a billion people. We all know that. Like, and there was actually, we will ask you this question to start off. We randomly talked about it, me and Brayden earlier about this, uh, this IPL cricket league that was started by a bunch of farmers and sold off to Russia. Oh no. Did you hear about this? It's crazy, right? <laughs> I have to ask a question and what, what like your thoughts are on it because 
I, I've read it and I was like, this is hilarious. Like, I can't believe someone actually thought this was real. Yeah, I mean, it, would, it was just a big ruse for betting or in the end, wasn't it? Yeah, it, Russia wasn't was just the, like yeah. betting on some farmers in the middle of nowhere, yeah. like just with questionable gear and just, just throwing it, the ball over, whatever you want to call it, pitching. Kind of a, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, this is going to be interesting. <laughs> she's like, she's going to hate me by the end of this. Like, I don't mean this in a disrespectful way. Like, I promise. It's just me and my it's ignorance. It's pretty hard to offend me. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's it's enormous. It's huge. Um, it is, like people say, it's like a religion. It is kind of like a religion. It's like the IPL is the biggest domestic cricket league in the world. Um, so all the biggest stars go and play there from all over the world and you know, there are times where I've covered a game and there's been four international captains playing in the one game. It's it's insane. So the way that I describe it is basically like like the NBA. There's domestic cricket leagues all over the world, but that's the one that everyone wants to play in. And the muddy is just astronomical. Um, To the point that the the rights just came up recently and my um, understanding of it was that there were other global rights that were being basically put on hold to find out who got this and then how much money it left them with. Because obviously uh-huh. now with huge streaming giants yeah, and, yeah, yeah. you know, Disney is ESPN, but it's also Star Sports and all this sort of thing. How can we piece all the puzzles together? So that's how enormous it is. It's it's become like the NBA rights, um, the EPL rights, those mm. those sort of things from an um, international perspective. So it's, it's enormous and it's so much fun. Um, I came on board during the pandemic. So, I mean, just the... <sighs> That would have been an experience in itself, I feel like. Yeah, like most of it's been in the UAE that I've that I've done and in a bubble environment. We didn't have crowds for the first couple of goes, but this year I finally um, got to do it in India with crowds. It was still in a bubble, but the you know, the final, for example, was in front of more than a hundred thousand people Jeez. and um just so much fun and and it, it's awesome. And they're so they're just so friendly and nice yeah. and so passionate and um yeah, I've, I've just had the most wonderful experience uh, working over there and um, both with like the players, the colleagues and the fans, um, but I also just had bizarre experiences too. Like last year in going to India um, and it ended up being in the peak of the pandemic in the world. Yeah, yeah. Um, so and they then had a real big problem there too for a while. Massive. Like. And I like, I mean, I'd been banned from my home state for a year and now I was banned from my entire country. Like yeah. we couldn't get home because Scott Morrison decided that India was banned. Mm. So all of a sudden you're in a foreign country and you don't like, you can't you go no anywhere. direction of what you're going to no. do. No. Yeah. Um, so even that in itself is kind of a crazy story. Like ended up in the Maldives for two weeks just to be able to come home in, you know, it's, I know. It's not a terrible it's, alternative, to correct, be honest. Like, but it was such a bizarre <laughs> life experience, um, you, you know, with 30 of Australia's elite cricketers. Um, you would have become close, I feel like, some of them. That would have been kind of cool, like, experience. Oh, yeah, a lot like of them were already my then, mates. Yeah, so, yeah. It, it, you know, that wasn't a problem at all. It was just kind of this weird, like... And I remember um, Kane Williamson, who is a um, New Zealand's premium cricketer, basically. Yeah, just, I'm, you'll I'm have to, you'll have to describe I know, I, everyone. I'm, I'm going to assume you. everyone that's listening knows these people. Just he's, look at my blank face and just say, yep, uh-huh, and just roll through the next one. <laughs> he's, the, he's the skipper of the Kiwis, and he's a very quiet, um, yeah, softly spoken guy um, and I remember there was sort of stingrays being fed and he sort of just looks at me and goes, how did we get here? <laughs> like, I'm confusion. still wondering because we've just gone from this, you know, crazy scenario and, and we're all so concerned about all mm. of our mates um, in India. And that was like the, the original point is that I was, you know, obviously in an environment that was a little daunting because I couldn't get home and didn't know what was happening, but I knew it would be fine. I'm not a sort of panicking type person. And I'd played out a lot of these scenarios before getting on the plane in the first place. Um, and my parents are pretty good with the fact that I'm that kind of person as well. Um, and I was also like, I'm in the same place as Ricky Ponting and Pat Cummins and Steve Smith. It's okay. They're not going to leave me names. behind. Yeah, there you names. go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Indian mates that I had were unbelievable because they were literally every day making phone calls to find mm. oxygen and hospital beds for someone they cared about. Oh, yeah. And every day you would hear this and yet every morning they would wake up and they go, how are you going? Are you okay nearly? Is your family okay? Just the the kindness and compassion of people to still ask me how I'm going when I know my family was relatively safe, right? Yeah. Um, 
just unbelievable human being. So I will always have such a special connection with that country um, from here on in because of that experience. Generosity. And, yeah. Like and it. as you yeah. know, like it's when things are hard, that's when you find out people's true character. So true. So true. So an incredible experience in, in so many ways through highs and lows. Well, we'll move to another place, maybe um, a bit closer to my home. Now, you recently covered the Super Bowl in Miami. Yes. Tell us about that experience. Yeah. So, we did Miami in 2020, um, which was amazing. And then LA this year. I was supposed to do the one in between as well, but, you know, pandemic. Um, so. <laughs> the way you look at it is not a fan of that. Uh- <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> Yeah, I miss I miss Brady, but you know he's unretired, so maybe Google's I'll get 70. another one. <laughs> like, yeah, it's crazy. Um, but Super Bowl is just unbelievable. It's like nothing else in the world for a, a like. I, I know there's a season, but from a global perspective, it's a one-off event, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, I, I guess a football World Cup final maybe competes, but pretty much everyone has also watched the entire competition unfold as well. So Mm. as far as just eyeballs tuning in for one game, I would say this is unique in that. Mm. Um, and and just the OB trucks, um, so they're the big trucks that, that broadcasters have just to put yeah. it to air. There's hundreds of them. I've oh, never yeah. experienced anything like it in my life. Um, and the in Miami, for example, the set was like 500 metres of purpose-built sets on the beach, and that's not even for the game. That's just for the build-up for the week. So they're bigger sets than anything I've ever worked on in Australia, yeah. and they're just there for, like, the five days building up to it. Um, this year it was in L.A., and because um, I was working with ESPN Australia, which is a Disney partner yep. um, or affiliate, and our set was – so we used the same one as the domestic guys did, and it was unbelievable. It's next level over there, right? Eh? It's next level. So there's this huge set that's in front of the um, world famous like Disney um, Mickey Mouse Ferris wheel. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, just crazy. And our show, this is hilarious. And you'll find this funny now being in a, you know, an American who plays in the AFL is that our show was going to air on the big screens around Disney, but it was our Australian one. So I'm like, for example, interviewing um, a feature story with Ben Griffiths, former yeah. like Richmond. USC? Yeah, legend. Exactly. Legend, good friend, yeah. Really good guy. <laughs> but like people in Disney are like, who the hell's the dude with the mustache? <laughs> Why does everyone have an Australian accent? Like, <laughs> what is going on? Australian <laughs> accent. Um, and so that was so cool. When we realised we're on the big screen, we were like, we're on the big screen at Disney. <laughs> we made it to Disneyland. <laughs> we made it to Disneyland. And I got the photo of me as a 12-year-old with Dopey. Oh. And I'm like, how it started, how oh, it's going. Yeah, love <laughs> and then it was really cute because there was this little kid. He would have been, I don't know, 11 or 12 at yeah. the Super Bowl came up to me, little American kid, and he goes, excuse me, are you the woman that was hosting at Disneyland? And I'm like, yes, this is the coolest moment of my life, getting recognised at the Super Bowl from hosting at Disneyland. Oh, it's been so cool. (laughs) So he's like, can I get a photo? Can I get a photo? (laughs) Yes, that's it. You're like, I would love to. I would love to. It was so cool. Um, So... And it was funny, like different people, because I had told people I was going to, you know, to the Super Bowl, obviously, and yep. that was what I was excited about as a sports lover. Um, but everyone, when they were watching on Instagram and stuff, they're like, hang on, what? You're in Disneyland? Like, they were more excited. I was excited. more excited about that, yeah, yeah than the <laughs> actual I, Super Bowl. Like, the lightsaber that I got given, which is basically like a real life lightsaber, more people were interested in. Okay, I will, Nick Revolt, for example, was like, how much? I'll buy it from you. I, I swear to God, I will buy it. And I was like, no, nah, the niece and nephews are getting it. So. Oh, it's unreal. Did you ever go on any like pre-parties or anything like that? I didn't this year because I really wanted to avoid COVID ahead of NBA yeah, All-Star sense, weekend because yeah. I knew that I had that to look forward to and I didn't want to put that in jeopardy. But in Miami, I did, yeah. Yeah, because that was just before I COVID. Like Miami and LA, you've picked really good spots. To I be know, the Super and next Bowl year's is Phoenix. Like, I'm like, I only do hot Super Bowls. Yeah, <laughs> only <and> like <laughs> being a Suns lover. Yeah, that's it. Like, You'll be like going I'm to NBA games at the same time. Exactly. So you picked all the places you essentially wanted to go to. Is, is, is what's <laughs> happened, but that is an amazing experience. It's tough to describe to people how big the or sorry the uh, the Super Bowl is in America, and it's cool that like I love the fact that you've got to experience not only one like media in America at its best and its biggest kind of like production yeah but i think the game itself were you in the stadium yeah 
Yeah. yeah okay. so, so hosted from within the stadium. Um, the first time was outside the stadium, but w- went inside to watch the game. This yeah. this year was hosting inside the the stadium, um, and then watching the game as well from there. So, right. and I got I got really lucky with the two halftime shows as well because I got um, like oh, J Lo, yes. Snoop, and yeah, and then too. this year I got like Eminem. Oh. And, yeah, it was how good was that halftime show? Uh, it, was, I, it was so good. Goat. Greatest of all time. Yeah. It was, Greatest of all time. It, I mean, I'm I'm very lucky. <laughs> I'm very jealous. This is essentially what I've got to. Um, well, you've done some amazing things as, we, as we've gone through. I want to talk about, I guess, being female in sporting culture here. I, I know it's it's kind of crazy because there's not it's, – it's changed quite a bit over the last few years. Females are now kind of uh, – with AFLW being a big push in Australia, I feel like there's a lot more females that are now commentating. They're on panels and everything else. I'd love to get your perspective being one of the probably – the people that started before, I guess, this change, and maybe you're kind of the originals that was in, uh, original females that was in kind of media before all this kind of happened. Um, what is your perspective on how much it's changed in the industry of female in sport? Yeah, and look, I'll give a shout out because there's obviously women that came before me and every generation of women push it um, a little bit further. Um, and the, the times that I've sort of wanted to give up, and there have definitely been times that I've wanted to walk away because it's all too hard. Um, I then think, well, wherever I quit is where I'm leaving it for the next lot of women coming through. So the yeah. harder that we all push, the further we go for them. And then they can pick up from that spot and push even harder and keep advancing. Um, so I'm really passionate about it and I think I've gotten more passionate about it the older that I get as well. Um, you know, seeing images like today of the AFLW with all 18 clubs now involved and it just, it makes me so happy because I've, I've got a, you know, a 10-year-old niece who plays footy. She plays with the boys. She plays with the girl. She loves it. Um, she goes for Frio because I go for Frio. Um, and, you know, all of a sudden, not only does she have an actual platform to to advance in that sport that I never had. I never got to play footy as a kid. I played soccer with all the boys, yeah. um, but footy didn't exist uh, where I was anyway for, for girls. And I would have loved to have played cricket, for example, um, as a girl, and that, that didn't exist outside of the backyard. So the fact that my 10-year-old niece now does all of these things and it's mm. normal for her, but more importantly, it's normal for her three little brothers and her now three little brothers play footy because their cool big sister does and their oh, auntie that. reports on it. Yeah. Immediately yeah. like that, it's completely shifted for that generation of, of boys. So it's hugely important. Um, we've gotten better at on air. There's still a long way to go. Um, I would also like to see a huge shift behind the scenes. There are still so few female producers and definitely female executives, um, in, in the media landscape. And uh, I think that's a really important area because like any diversity, the more opinions you have and different insights you have, the better product you're going to get at the end of the day, because you're sharing ideas and exchanging, you know, thoughts and opinions and values, and you're going to just get a better product rather than the same type of person in the room over and over and over again. Yeah. yeah. Do you have any role models growing up? Anyone yeah. you looked up to in the media so like landscape that you go, oh, if I can be somewhat like her and, and look up to the way she kind of handled the situation. Because I, I can only imagine being one of the originals and I'm not so here to like kind of be detrimentally talking about kind of media and the lack of female representation over the past however many years. But is there anyone kind of growing up you kind of looked to and was like, oh my gosh, she's kind of my idol? Yeah, Joe Griggs and Karen Ty were the, the two for me. Um, they were pretty much two of the only women on it. Yeah, it would have been. When, yeah. I, when I was younger. Um, Tiff Cherry... Um, and, and yeah, those sort of figures as I got older, um, got opportunities, but, um, yeah, Karen Ty, um, has been around for quite a long time and, um, and he's just an incredible person. So is Joe, um, you know, that whole thing of don't meet your heroes, those two, you can absolutely tick off. They are unbelievable (laughs) human beings. Um, so they were probably the two, uh, that I looked to, um, and it's not in a sporting landscape, but I, <laughs> you're going to tease me for this. I love this. Go ahead. I say that some people find religion. I found Oprah. <laughs> Oprah. Yes. You get a car. You get a car. You get a car. I, I love it. She is. She is redefined, I think, like women in media. And to be a black woman who had the upbringing that she mm. did and has achieved what she did in the era that she has unbelievable we i know this sounds a bit silly but we 
undervalue Oprah because <laughs> her impact on, you know, i that's what I would watch. I, I, I found her so impressive in the way that she interviewed. She knew when to be humorous. She knew when to pull back. She knew mm. when to be a little bit more aggressive. She knew when to just be silent. And so I kind of married up mum talking about psychology and the way that she would get things out of patients and Oprah and the way that she would get things out of her subjects. And I kind of, you know, like to be sort of similar in the way that sometimes she does really fun stuff and sometimes she yeah. does really hardcore stuff. And I like to see myself as being, I'm not Oprah, but that versatile. You're well on your way. You're well on your way. You're well I've got a good way. name for it, though, yeah, don't I? Just, <laughs> but she was sort of, and, and so many things that she, you know, would speak about over and over and over has been the way that I view, you know, the world, listening to the little voice in your head and, make, you know, acknowledging when you feel a certain way because there's a reason why you do. All yeah. of those sorts of things. Um, yeah, so she was and still is um, one of the great influences of my life. If I could meet anyone, it would be Oprah. Oprah. Yeah. If you had three people you wanted to go have dinner with, Oprah would be one of them. I like this question. Huge. My answer to this two? is Barack Obama, Oprah, and my best mate, Aaron, so that we could talk about it for years. Oh, now. I was about to say, I was like, <laughs> Aaron is going to get. Aaron's an getting a seat at the table. Wow. But don't you, how, can you argue with my logic though? I'd just FaceTime if- someone in. I, mean, I, would, I wouldn't actually <laughs> bring it to the table. I would just like <laughs> use the magic of technology you to bring agree, all my you? friends. <laughs> See, smart, smart thinking. Because yeah. then you can sit back, have wines at Vast Felix and, mm. you know, just talk Oprah about that night with Oprah Obama. and Barack Obama. <laughs> I reckon they would, have, they would be able to riff off each other very well too. Oh, exactly. Like you got to be strategic about this. Oh my gosh. Like Oprah, I remember Oprah was doing the interview with the, um, Duke, Duke and Duchess, I think. Mm-hmm. See, I'm still trying to get my head around the royal family, but yeah. that interview is awesome. I love that because she she's kind of back to the back end of her career now, where she doesn't have to deal with it as much. Like she's made her money, she's like done what she wants to yeah. do. She doesn't have to prove anything. Yeah, and she did that to really kind of like tell their genuine story behind it. That was the first time I think I really became an Oprah fan. Oh, she she's amazing. Honestly, my childhood is just dotted with the <laughs> Oprah Winfrey show. I never saw this coming. Never no. saw Oprah coming on the podcast. Um, See, I have girly things. I mean, I like... <laughs> Oprah. I just love it. Next is going to be Ellen DeGeneres. Um, <laughs> I'll ask you this. Um, for female in sport, what do you think is the next big hurdle to overcome? Um, I Like I say, more women behind the scenes. Um, so, for example... AFLW in coaching ranks as well. Um, Why has it not worked out as well as it probably should have? What are we not doing to support people? What can we be doing better? Um, Behind the scenes in the media, as I say, there should be female executives, there should be female producers. Um, And I've actually worked with more female producers in India in the last two years um, in cricket than I have in is there, like, comparative India media and Australian media, is there a lot more female representation in India than Australia? Uh, behind the scenes, in my experience, there has been, yeah. There's still a long way to go in India as yeah. well, but um, I think we can definitely do more here in Australia for those sorts of roles, yeah, yeah. Um, and I would love to see that happen. Just trying to increase the diversity on all levels, and we were talking before we started recording this about Nadine, your new um, yes. comms manager, who is she's just- going to listen to this pod and be huge. I'm very happy that we- she, I <laughs> mean, <laughs> she's <laughs> a massive, like, just a star, 28-year-old woman who's just dominating in the AFL um, landscape, and just makes me feel brighter and happier about the future to come, because mm. she's just an incredible person and just sees the world differently, because as you say, every lot of women coming through you have you know hopefully a more positive experience than the, than the previous generation so she makes me feel happy basically like talking to her I just go okay we're getting somewhere we're on the right path. yeah we're on the right path and there's still a really long way to go but I think there are some things that are happening that um, make me feel much better but I mean there was another one like earlier this year in Pakistan um You know, you would think that that was the kind of place that you would have an experience like this because of the biases or whatever that we have of of the stereotypes of of places. But there was the men's test between Australia and Pakistan. It was the first time in more than two decades that Australia had toured Pakistan because of the security concerns. So it was a huge deal. And we had myself and Zainab co-hosting and Uruj, who was a former um, female player and selector, 
and Simon Cadditch. So there were four people and 75% of us were women hosting a men's test match. Yeah, okay. Now that just doesn't happen. Nah. And so for it to happen in Pakistan was amazing. And it was cool that it happened with Simon Cadditch as well because I've interviewed him and, you know, had so much to do with him and, and good mates with him over such a long period of time. And it was really nice that he was there and, and he thought it was really cool. Yeah, um, he bought into it. He bought into yeah. it, yeah. And it wasn't a gimmick. It just happened to be how the roster fell that day. Mm. So, yeah, moments like that, I get goosebumps talking about it, but moments like that fill me with a lot of joy. It's like um, we did a little bit of a TV thing called On The Mark. I don't know if you remember this yes. back in the day. And it was all female cast. Yeah. I loved it. It was good fun. Like, I could have <laughs> stayed there all day. Now, I got a pie out of that day too, which was awesome. Uh, it, was <laughs> it was delicious. July 4th, it was delicious. It? it was July 4th. It was. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Independence Day. Uh, and that was all female cast. And yeah. I found it like that was very different feel in there. Where like you talk about even on your podcast where you can – I don't know. It's like a, maybe it's like a motherly instinct of like, you know, you just are more willing to open up to females than males sometimes. And, you know, you're probably not going to cop the backlash or the banter, quote unquote, of Australian media if you're kind of in a female cast. Like I remember being on there and I was just like totally comfortable walking in, knew everyone, like just said, hi, what's up? And just, I don't remember what we talked about, probably my career and everything else, you know, but like I just felt really at ease, like yeah. for some reason. And I think there's something that, um, as a as a person on the other side of the camera, like, and maybe you talk about producers and stuff that they can maybe realize that there is a, a, a bit of value to that of having a lot more females in, in things like whether it be, you know, media shows, um, you know, sideline stuff, like I know Abby Holmes and Daisy Pierce are smashing it in the media now and they're doing so well and it's, it's great to see him and Daisy's like same thing with Abby, like they know their stuff and it's mm. like, they just slot in like seamlessly and it's so good to see. Yeah, and I think, like, I sort of always describe myself as a little sister, and although I'm older than pretty much everyone in the AFL now, except for David Mundy. Keep going, please, David. <laughs> um, in in roles in commentary teams and stuff, I always sort of describe myself as a little sister, and I think, you know, you do talk to your sisters, to your, mm. your, um, your girlfriends, your mother, as you said, more openly, I think, about yeah. emotional stuff, and you do, because it's not as combative or competitive or whatever and you know it's great that boys are getting better at talking about their feelings um Still a while to go i think yeah um but i think yeah it is there is something to be said for we come from a different perspective and you just don't know what that's going to bring to the table unless you let us sit at the table that's oh, so true is there anyone you look at now that's coming through the ranks even from aflw or anything like that that you just are thoroughly impressed with i mean i'm a big fan of chloe malloy who's obviously yep. at your she club. actually stalked me uh one day going to get a scan and she was like apologizing <laughs> as she was stalking me and I was there like, are moments where you like, become friends with me you when you're like sorry yeah it's like it's like she was kind of like <laughs> Like, I, she was apologizing, but also having to ask the questions. Yeah, it is. You're like yeah. walking up. You're like, I'm not going to tell you anything. I don't know anything yet. And then she sends me a message after. She's like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. I'm so embarrassed. I was like, yeah. you're just doing your job. Like, <laughs> it yeah. doesn't really bother me. But it was weird seeing like someone who's like on part of our like program and then also like asking me like questions that the media is trying to like, you know, get out of me. But she is, she's lovely. She's so funny. She's an absolute gun at, you know, basketball as well, obviously, as yeah. well as footy and just a lovely person and yeah, so she's probably the one that I'd pick out of that, yeah. So what's next for you? So I am heading off to Europe in about uh, 12 hours. I still have a pack. Oh, <laughs> um, gosh. The important booked, things last, right? I, you yeah, save the best for last. my flats like two weeks ago. Um yeah, so I'm heading over to Europe just for travel because usually, as we sort of touched on, I'm doing footy, but um, sort of most of my work is overseas at the moment um, yep. and with the NDM Premier League and stuff. So I get to just travel for fun uh, over the next few weeks, okay. which I'm really excited about. I've never been able to do it this time of year. Um, yeah usually sort of go in that October, November range. So I'm excited for that. And uh, and then, yeah, Women's Basketball World Cup and Men's Cricket World Cup later mm. in the year. So it's good. It's fun. I'm sort of – my two passions in, the in in you know, the professional environment are live, live sport, you know, major events and, um, and long-form interviews. So if I can keep sort of ticking those two things off and then – have time to travel and spend time with family and friends, and I'm pretty happy. I'm very jealous of this whole trip to Europe. It's, it is summer. It's prime time. It's one of the downsides of playing IFL is you never get the European summer, but I'm glad you get to experience it. Um, I want to say personally a massive thank you for coming on. My mom's going to be so pumped for this podcast. I'm not going <laughs> to lie. Um, but and honestly, you're, you're breaking the glass ceiling, and I love it. You're, you're a perfect person for it who um, 
like I said before, is, is someone everyone seems to really want to open up to and you're just a very calming personality. So I want to say personally, thank you for coming on the podcast, but also thank you for being such a shining light in the media as a female. So um, thanks so much for coming on. Well, thank you very much for having me and all the kind words as well. And you may not know this name, but as Rove McManus would always finish his show with, say hi to your mum for me. Oh, Rove. I do know Rove. <laughs> oh, there you go. 